In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Welcome back for the link. Uh, today we're going to be discussing a topic that I feel is so important uh, as, a, as a church community, uh, especially during these times of COVID, where we don't spend a whole lot of time with others, uh, as much as we used to at least. And today's topic is really how do we approach others and speak to others about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? How is it that we reach the world for Christ? St. Justin Martyr said in his first apology, chapter 44, if we persuade even a few, our gain will be very great, for we shall receive the reward from the master. There is a great reward prepared for those who reach others, who gain others for the sake of the kingdom. As stewards, we should be seeing the talents that God has given us, the time that God has given us, the ability that God has given us, the knowledge and the faith that he's given us as a a useful means to be utilized for the sake of the kingdom of God. And what Justin Martyr here is reminding us of in his first apology is that we are to use those talents, those time, those gifts, those resources, those relationships that we have for the sake of the kingdom. And when we do, there is a great reward that we shall receive from the master. And that reward from the master is a reward that's laid up for us in the heavens. I want to talk about 10 quick points on how we can reach others for the sake of the kingdom by reaching outwards. Number one is by showing love, showing love. The, the, the basis of the gospel is that Christ became love incarnate. He came into the world, he reached into the world, and he came and met with people where they were at. With Christ, it wasn't a numbers game, it was a personal relationship that he developed with each person. He first called 12 persons or individuals to follow him, and he developed a relationship with them. He then grew that number to about 70. And along the way, he would preach to large masses, but he would always touch individual persons one by one along the road. Even when he was in large gatherings, there would always be a personal encounter where he would show love to people. Whether it was the Samaritan woman, it was Zacchaeus in the sycamore tree, It was the man who was paralyzed that was lowered by his group of four friends in the house that was uh, just overwhelmed with numbers of people. Number two is always think about the right questions. When Christ would approach people, he would begin by asking questions. Do you want to be made well? It's really important for Christ and for us to know, does a person want to be made well? Do, Do we really, we're sick, Do we really want to get better? Uh, Christ asked, where's your husband? To the Samaritan woman, right? He didn't come right in, though he had the knowledge. He first asked, show me your husband. Where's your husband? Right? So always begin with asking the right questions. What questions might you ask? And very important, as you're asking these questions, be sure to be present with your questions and not agenda-driven. The goal is not, I'm going to start here and I'm going to end here, and I need to run through my list of five questions, but they're questions that point to the kingdom, but also intersect with people's lives. And be present with the questions as you ask them. Number three is learn to listen. One of the ways that we, in fact, remain present with our questions is listening to the response. Part of our challenge in society today is we ask questions and then we're off thinking about the first thing that the person says to us, how we're going to respond to that specific uh, response that they give us. Learn to listen to what it is that they are saying, what it is that they're not saying, what it is that they're feeling. Learn to listen so that if you ask another question, that the question connects to really where they're at. Like imagine you ask the question to someone why they don't believe and they, they, they told you, you know, it's because they lost a loved one. 
And your response immediately is to go into a defense about, you know, the love of God. And all that is good and well and true. But perhaps you want to ask a question about the person that they lost. How did it happen? How did it affect them? What are they feeling today? Really being empathic by learning to listen to the other. Number four is once you've connected with the person, truly connected with the person, because you've asked questions that are person-centric and you've listened to the person in front of you because you care about them, you love them, you're interested in them, you're sincere about wanting to know them and meet with them, number four is you then make the connection to the gospel. Acts chapter 17, verse 22 to 23. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, therefore the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaimed him to you. St. Paul here is telling the people in, Ara- in the midst of Areopagus, I found someone, I examined, I searched your life, I searched your worship, and I found a connection. There's actually the one, this unknown God who you seek to worship. I'm here to tell him, tell you about him. I'm here to proclaim this unknown God to you. The one who you worship without knowing, I come to proclaim to you. The pain that you're feeling, there is one who can take away that pain, who can comfort you. He is the comforter. The questions that you have about science, about creation, there is the one who created all things. Your questions about metaphysics, about purpose in life. There's one who has come to reveal your purpose truly to you. The connection can only be made once there's non-agenda-driven questions that are asked and you truly listen, not just to the words that are being said, but what's not being said. Number five, Christ sent the disciples out two by two. And when he sent them out, he sent them out in order to meet with others and to engage with others, he never sent them one by one, right? He would always send them in teams, not in gangs. When Christ sent out the, 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 the two by two, they, the disciples went out not to overpower others, but to complete one another. Perhaps one person is listening and responding and the other one is praying. And perhaps the one who's responding is actually missing what the other person is saying. And so the one who's standing there praying is able to really respond truly to the the other, but not in a spirit that's ganging up, but in a spirit that's looking to serve the other, to meet the other, to connect to the other. So number five is team up, don't gang up. Number six, give an apology. An apology here is not an apology in the modern sense of the word where we say, I'm sorry. No, it's, it's not apologizing for the bad things that have happened. Yes, you may offer up condolences and apology if you know others have done wrong to a person but to give an apology in the christian in the biblical sense of the word it's to give an, a defense it's to give an explanation and this is different than giving make, entering into an argument as christians we do not need to jump into arguments and fight with people you first want to listen to questions when you offer up questions, listen to what's being said and make a determination if now is the time to, to, to have a, continue the conversation or not. Maybe you try to make a connection and the person is not prepared yet for um, a, a, an ongoing discussion. But perhaps what needs to be done is to give an explanation, to give an apology, to give a, a defense for the hope that is in you. St. Irenaeus, in his letter to Florinus, he says, I can tell also the very place where the blessed Polycarp was accustomed to sit and discourse, the form of his appearance and his conversations with people. See, Polycarp, who was a disciple of 
St. John the Beloved, also had a disciple named St. Irenaeus. St. Irenaeus is sitting here. He's describing, I remember watching Polycarp. He would sit in the marketplace and he would discourse with people. He would respond to their questions, their inquiries. It's not about giving a sermon, but an explanation, an apology, if you will, for the hope that is in you. Uh, During a, a trip down to Bermuda, I met a gentleman down there who uh, we, we, we ran into each other in the park and uh, he came up to me and, you know, he started asking me questions uh, about, you know, why I was there, why the group was there. And, uh, and then I asked him, you know, like, so do, do you believe? And his response was really like heartfelt. And he said, no, I, you know, I, I used to believe. And I said, what happened? And he told me, you know, I, I, I walked into a church. I lost my father when I was a little boy. I was really young. My father abandoned me. And then I walked into a church. And the, the one, one pastor said he didn't have time for me. I said, okay, so why did you stop? He said, no, I didn't stop. You know, I went to another church. And in that church, you know, the, the, the pastor was there and he accepted me. But once I said I didn't have, you know, money to donate... He said, I, I, he didn't have time any longer. So I began to listen, like, what was it that this gentleman was actually saying? He wasn't saying he didn't believe in God. He was saying he had been hurt by the fact that his dad abandoned him and by the fact that he felt that these two leaders, Christian leaders, were supposed to be shepherds. And in fact, they didn't shepherd him, that they were wolves in sheep's clothing that they had actually done him harm. We have to listen to what people are saying and what people are not saying. Sometimes people are hurt by pride of others, by wars and crusades that they've seen, by suffering, by philosophical questions, by Christian hypocrisy, by ecclesial immorality, by confusion, by biblical misunderstanding or by scientific questions that are left unanswered. And so rather than jumping into an immediate response, listen first to what is being said, continue to ask questions to understand where the other person is coming from, and then at that point you can give a proper apology. Number seven is the proper apology, the discourse begins with sharing your own experience of Christ. In other words, what has God done in your life? What has God done in your life? Be spiritual, not carnal. Oftentimes when I hear Christians speaking about what God has done in their life, they'll talk about how God has blessed them with a job or with a house or with a spouse. Or they'll talk about how God has blessed them with wealth or with health. The problem with all of these is these are all carnal. These are all fleshly. These are all temporal. Talk about what God has done in your life spiritually. And if you don't have a spiritual uh, experience to share, then that's something that you personally need to dig on. Why is it that you don't have a spiritual encounter with Christ? Why is it that your only encounter with Christ may be in carnal, fleshly temporal things. What has God done in your life? Begin with that. Has he liberated you from sin? Has he freed you from bondage? Have you experienced the joy of the kingdom? Have you fallen in love with the beauty and the glory and the majesty of God? Have you enjoyed the abundant life of joy and hope and peace since you've begun to walk with the kingdom and in the values of the kingdom. Be appropriate. If God has liberated you, be appropriate about what you share. There's no need to share everything that I was, I know for some people they want to talk about, I was once, you know, in sin. And absolutely, it's good to talk about God has freed me from sin. But sometimes when we share too much, too soon, it can also cause others to stumble. It's okay to say, you know, I was once 
in bondage to sin. And I once struggled with sin and some really grotesque sin. But God has freed me from those sins. He has liberated me. He has brought me out of the pits of hell. Number five, be courageous. Be courageous. Be strong and of good courage as you go out. Courage is not cockiness, it's confidence. We want to be courageous as disciples of Jesus Christ to speak the truth in love. As God was sending Joshua, the young leader who was taking over from Moses into the promised land, into the land of Canaan, he was about to enter into a really difficult time of life where there was going to be so much battle that was ahead of him. What does God tell him? He says, be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from, uh, turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Be courageous. Sometimes it can be really overwhelming to go and to speak to others and to reach others for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. But be courageous and be courageous to trust that God is the one who is leading you. Be courageous that God is going to speak and give you the words to speak. Just as our Lord promised that the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, would come and remind us all things that he has proclaimed. But we have to have the courage to also to learn to rely on on Christ, to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit rather than simply being guided by our own uh, impulses and ambitions and desires. Number nine, use simple language. (laughs) Use simple language. Avoid cliches. Avoid the Christianese. Like, it's so funny when I see Christians speaking to to a non-Christian or someone who's far from the church and the, the, some of the language that they'll begin to use, sometimes extremely complicated words that people need a dictionary or a thesaurus in order to understand. Christ's teachings were very simple, and he usually used parables to explain the principles of the kingdom of God. Some of the cliches that I hear people saying the, uh, you know, to, to others, especially those outside of the, you know, the, the, the the Christian life, is things like, just let go and let God. People are like, what does that even mean? Like, what does it mean, let go and let God? Like, you may not even, you may have heard that your whole life and still not even know what that means. It means to surrender. It means to surrender. It means to truly let go of the things that we want and to trust in God. So just put it in simple words. (laughs) Sometimes we want to have these really cool, fancy cliches that we throw out or that we've heard. Just use simple language um, and, you know, as you explain. Another one is just ask Jesus into your heart. Like, what, what, what does that mean for a non-Christian? Ask Jesus into my heart. Perhaps what you're trying to say is you need to develop a relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, and surrender yourself. Another one is I was born again. Like, I was born again. Yes, if you're going to say I was born again, yes, we were. In baptism, of course, we were born again. Of water and spirit. This is exactly what our Lord said to Nicodemus. But when we're talking to someone who's carnal, they may not understand that. So explain it to them before simply throwing it, those, you know, those phrases out there. Or another one is I was saved. I was saved from what? I was saved from who? You know, I was saved from myself. I was saved from sin. I was saved from death. I was saved from the, the evil one. Some other funny ones that I've heard is, 
We as Christians, we don't say hello. We greet one another with a hug and a holy kiss. When Christians say goodbye, we declare, have a Jesus-filled day. God willing, God will not give you more than you can handle. But sometimes people feel like there's things that are more than they can handle. So explain that to someone. Like, what does that mean that God will not give you more than you can handle? What, what it means is that God is meeting with you there. That he is walking through all of this with you. That God's not going to abandon you. And the last one is, everything happens for a reason. What? Like, that is so loaded to say that to someone. Everything happens for a reason. Then they're going to turn to you and say, well, what's the reason? You're going to say, I don't know. Well, don't say things that you don't know, right? So we need to avoid Christian cliches, be present with people. Sometimes you can say, I'm not sure why this has happened, but I'm willing to pray with you. I'm willing to, to seek answers for you. But just to say everything happens for a reason, those are sometimes statements that are intended that we just close the door because we don't know what else to say. So we say that to shut the door and finish the conversation because we don't know what else to say. Number 10 is follow up if need be. Follow up if need be. Acts chapter 15, verse 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. St. Paul and Barnabas, St. Barnabas, they went back. They went back and they visited those who they had visited before, that they had preached the gospel to before. Follow up with others. If someone asks you a question, follow up with them. Say, hey, I, I, you know, I did some research. I found a sermon for you to read, or I found this book that I think you might find extremely helpful. Or, you know, you told me you were struggling with this sin, and I just wanted to check in and see how you're doing and let you know that I'm, I'm here, I'm praying for you. If there's anything I can do for you, let me know. Or I know you said, you know, you were looking for a church or you didn't really feel comfortable in your previous church. And I just wanted to see if you might feel comfortable, you know, coming to church with me. Follow up and reach out to others. Express that love. And finally, number 11, this is the bonus one. When you're speaking with others, this is especially for my Coptic friends, Yes, we have a particularity. Copt, we have a unique experience of God throughout the generation, throughout the centuries, but Christ remains the focus. Christ must always remain the focus. As we're reaching and meeting others for the sake of Jesus Christ, be sure that Christ always is the focus. And when you bring up your Coptic experience, It's simply an experience that intersects 2,000 years of Christianity for yourself and your ancestors, but the intersection is always in Christ, the person of Jesus Christ. As you have these conversations, be sure that you end them gracefully um, because, you know, sometimes other people might be worked up or might be antagonistic as you're speaking, be sure that you always respond and end with gentleness. I love this quote from On the Incarnation by St. Athanasius. He talks about how if a blind person, if he doesn't see the sun, but he feels the warmth coming from it, knows that the sun is above the earth, so also the naysayers, even if they don't believe, being still blind to the truth, yet at least knowing the power of others who believe. Be gracious in your response. You may have a conversation with someone, they may be mean and ugly and nasty and rude to you. Be gracious. Extend the warmth of Jesus Christ. If a blind person doesn't see the sun, but they feel the warmth, then they know that there's a sun out there that's been described. And if you're speaking with someone whose eyes have been closed or have not yet been opened, then extend grace and extend the loving warmth of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to conclude by reading from the uh, St. Ignatius' letter to the Ephesians, uh, paragraph 10. And he says that we should pray continually for the rest of mankind as well. 
that they might find God, for there is in them hope for repentance. Therefore, always allow them to be instructed by you, at least by your deeds. Be meek in response to their wrath, humble in opposition to their boasting. To their blasphemies, return your prayers. In contrast to their error, be steadfast in the faith, and for their cruelty, display your gentleness. While we take care not to imitate their conduct, let us be found their brothers in all true kindness. My prayer for you is that as you reach out to meet others for Christ, that you would make yourself a brother in kindness for those who may reject you. That you would reach out to others and extend the grace of God to one another. And that God would use you mightily for the sake of the kingdom. So that just as we heard at the very beginning, we might gain a reward for the master in the kingdom of God. All glory be to his name forever. Amen.